Okay, there's um the exit gate and oh wow, those are great. Yeah. You, you know, this acts as a um, security system. I didn't realize that. Oh, I'm getting, hey, everybody. I'm getting alerts every time they want uh, There's motion. Oh, Harvey. Yeah, we got Harvey. There's Michael's here with me, everybody. We're doing some getting ready for some stuff. Michael just wired us all up with security camera, new security cameras that he did on his dime. So. Yeah, and th this one's coming uh, tonight. <laughs> well, thank you, sir. I, uh, I don't make much noise. It'll be fine. I just hear, hear grinding on the wall. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Sorry for a little delayed start. We're doing a lot of stuff. Getting everybody, getting everybody on. Hello. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. I love that. No, I love that idea. I love it. Hey, everybody. Hello. Harvey, how are you doing? Harvey. Hi there. He's there. I'm here. We can hear him. This was our a little of our stuff from Tuesday, from yesterday. And I actually, for those who are with us, well, why don't we get I'm still getting Mike out of here? Thank you. Um, we actually had a um, look at today's Torah portion. We we showed people yesterday on Tuesday a little bit of what we're going to study today. Hey, Joyce. Hi. Here's Joyce. Hello. Joyce is saying hello. I'm saying. Oh wait, I need what? to zoom in. There's we're zooming in. We're, we're zooming in. All there right. we go. Ben. Hi. Good to see you all. Look, Joyce, you can see yourself at the top there now. Oh, see her? Hello to me. All right. Okay, see, no, wait. Your seat. Do you see? Wait. We, we need everyone. Y'all be standing up even. See, look, there you are. Hi, Much Joyce. Better. Hi. Camera's over here, Joyce. Yeah, but she was looking at herself. Camera's over here. <laughs> so. So I come to service. Oh, nice. Saturday morning. That's nice. There's Doreen, everybody. Doreen, wave to the camera. Doreen, wave to the camera. Oh, right there. That camera up there. So, yeah, we want to thank Michael, who's here uh, tonight. He's installing the last camera, security camera. He installed all new security cameras as a gift to, uh, from him, from himself to us, to all of us. Just very, very sweet. What? Before the holidays, so in case. Well, he, he's here. You know, just so you know, he's here. It's it's ninety degrees outside, and I'm wearing a fleece inside. I just turned on the air. It's seventy eight degrees in here, man. It's too hot. It says to have it's, 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 it says you're old. Yeah, I don't know exactly. I wasn't going to say that. But Mary said that, and she's a nurse. He's a medical professional. Tomorrow is Mary's birthday. Happy birthday, Mary. It's almost Rosh, almost Rosh Hashanah. Almost Rosh Hashanah. That's fantastic. <laughs> Yay, Doreen. Uh, we're just so, um, you guys, um, wow, so just so you know, yeah, yeah, the 26th, Joyce is the 26th, yes, it's almost Yom Kippur, right? It's the day before, day after, oh my god, yeah. 96, yeah. Next July, you're going to be, what, 100, Rabbi? <laughs> so how do you say things like that? It's it's not even like, he's not, you're not. 
no. it's already i already feel i already feel bad enough man so yeah thank you thank you i will t stop it i will uh tell you that i definitely around this time of year definitely want uh it gets tougher but i will say we want everybody to to stay safe uh we lost yeah we we've uh uh wendy's got covid so she's not gonna be able to be here for the kids service which is not good so uh we're, we're scrambling for how we're gonna take care of that but we're also asking people to register for services just let us know which days people are going to be here just so we can make sure everything's set up and so we asked people to do it probably a third of the, third of the people did uh but we're sending out another email later tonight to remind people to register even if you you know, paid your membership, whatever, just so we can roughly gauge how many people are coming. Um, we've got John and crew of people helping to move stuff over. So, you know, want to make sure we have prayer books for everybody. And and there are, it, it there will be a lot of people there this year. Uh, we're, right. we're definitely, people are uh, feeling more comfortable and bouncing back. And right. we just want to make sure we do it in a safe way and give everybody a feeling like, uh, we're doing what we need to do, um, aware of that, which we didn't have the capabilities three or four years ago even to really get a handle. I mean, we we did print up tickets before, but it was always a mess and people had them and didn't have them. And we never were really sure how many people would come. Now we have the technology where we can actually get a good gauge of it, but um, it only works if people fill it out. So we're, 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 uh, yeah, but we're much more, I mean, the information we have now is is much better. And actually, Harvey's on the line. He he was one of the people who helped us get uh, the the uh, thing going last year, the or two years ago, the the Give Smart mobile cause, it's called now. Um, he got it going. Um, and it's been a big help. So that being said, um, this is our last Wednesday night class of the year. And it's our last chance to study Deuteronomy. We're very close to the end of Deuteronomy. Last week we looked, uh, or not last week, two weeks ago. I apologize. Did not have class last week because it was my anniversary. Actually, on Wednesday night, it was our, not my anniversary, not my anniversary. It was our anniversary. That was definitely something that we achieved together. It was 30 years. 30 years. Wow. So 1993. So that was a special, yeah. How many years? Uh, special what? celebration, and uh, we actually, had, I actually had a wedding to do that night in Santa Barbara, and so we just stayed overnight um, and got to uh, to do that. But what? Not really. Not like it should have been. And then I had a wedding Saturday night down in Seal Beach, and it was like 90 degrees really? at the beach it was very uh humid outside yeah you got out lucky you didn't have to take tracy to to anniversary dinner went to the wedding dinner no <laughs> no <laughs> we could have maybe but that wasn't what wasn't wasn't <laughs> wasn't, what, wasn't wasn't what was planned <laughs> and it was a really nice place it was up at san Ysidro ranch which is pretty oh. darn nice <laughs> think it you get much nicer now but we didn't get to have dinner there nobody i don't want to talk about it but I'm on the air right now. So um, mm -hmm. I we went out for a nice vegan dinner in Montecito. So it was fine. It was beautiful. So, uh, and look, she knows. We, we, we oftentimes, we've had our anniversary on Rosh Hashanah before. So it happens. Um, it's a busy time. So, uh, so two weeks ago. What? No. Can't be on Yom Kippur. It can be on Rosh Hashanah. Oh, really? Can't be that. Won't be that early. Yom That's Kippur true. is never that early. Yom Kippur is usually, Yom Kippur like this year is pretty early. Like September 24th, 25th. That's on the early side. Uh, maybe within like four or five days. It could be like September 20th. Uh, Yom Kippur War, for example, 50 years ago was like October. Yeah, October 4th, 5th, 6th. I mean, yeah, I mean, Rosh Hashanah can even be the beginning of October. Of in a, in a, in a, it actually will not be next year. Next year it'll be, next year it'll be uh, about. I want to say it'll be about the end of September next year. It'll be about 
Yeah, maybe it'll be the beginning of October. I look it up. It might actually be. Maybe it will. Anyways, last or two weeks ago, last session we had, we actually looked at the holidays. Um, and we talked about the fact that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur weren't even listed on that list. They right, only took October 3rd, October yeah. 3rd, so the second is there. But there you go. So it's the beginning of October. So um, well, we have a 13-month year coming up on the Jewish calendar. That's why our lunar our lunar solar calendar. So yeah, we looked at this that the holidays and it talked about Passover, Shavuot, and Sukkot. It did not talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. They were not listed. They're listed in the Bible. They're listed in the list of holidays in Leviticus, but at least, and remember, Deuteronomy, we think, is later than Leviticus, written later, uh, at least in the book of Deuteronomy. If you only had the book of Deuteronomy as your bi in your Bible, you would not know there's a Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Wow. But even... Um... Leviticus, when it mentions it, it only mentions it very it briefly. Because it, it wasn't. Right. It wasn't. Right. Because it wasn't. It wasn't. It said this is a day of blowing the shofar. And right. at Yom Kippur, it says a day of self denial. Right. That's it. So, and in Numbers, it mentions it again in the list of holidays and the sacrifices that we give. But it's no different than the other holidays as far as the sacrifice that are given, that we give. So, again, by the time, again, in Deuteronomy, we don't have it listed at all. Um, so again, during the biblical period, it was not a major holiday. It was not a major holiday until the rabbinic period. And then I would say even the later rabbinic period. So even during the time of the second temple, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur were not that. Passover basically was the most. Passover was basically the most important by far, which is why we shouldn't be surprised that when Christianity developed out of it, that the holiday it developed out around was Passover. Not a coincidence. So it's why it has to be during. Well, it's supposed to be during Passover. It's not actually this year coming up. This year coming up in 2024, it's it has to do with the fact that the lunar exactly that when the full moon, when we have a when we have a situation like we do this year where we have a leap month, it forces the uh easter isn't technically based around passover even though it really is the intent is but it's the first full moon it's the sunday after the first full moon of spring and it just so happens that that doesn't happen for us this year with passover because of the leap month it got pushed so it's actually this year about a month after easter so it does happen sometimes where passover and easter don't come together but it's mainly again because easter technically isn't based on passover even though it is it's so, and two passover is always the first passover is the first full moon it's, it's, it's the first full moon in the month it's, it's the first full moon in the month it's the full moon of spring it's the full moon of the month of nisan it just so happens that this year nisan is is about a month late yeah yep the month before what happens the dark same thing with a birthday right right you celebrate it in the first of dark oh, is that what you do? Yeah. yeah it does happen so it's not like you celebrate it every time there's a darshani it's just the years that you have the darshani then you celebrate it in a darshani and this year uh because there's a darshani purim is is celebrated in the second right right celebrated a month before Passover. So that's our holidays coming up. That's the way the year looks already. I'm already thinking about that. But I'm thinking about the fact that Passover is we actually have an extra month before Passover. It also means we have an extra month for high holidays. It means I get it, I get 13 months before I have to start thinking about sermons again and tickets. <laughs> And moving stuff. And on and on, online. Yes, Purim we need we need help with too. Anyways, so hopefully we'll get a lot of people at Purim. By the way, one thing about that, since you mentioned it. So Purim we always know is a fun holiday. And it's interesting because there's a little play on the word Purim. 
it's it's we know that's supposed to be a happy day. We don't think about poor about Yom Kippur being a happy day, but it's an interesting rabbinic twist or pun, which is that Yom Kippur should be like Purim. Why? Because it's Yom Kippurim. Ki means like in Hebrew. So Yom Kippurim is a day like Purim. And so the rabbis posited that maybe we're really supposed to be joyous on Yom Kippur, which you don't think about it because it's a day of self-denial. It's a, The Bible says a day of fasting, day of self-denial, but of self-affliction. But the reality is, is why are you happy? Because you're going to be really happy because you're sealed for the book of, in the book of life. And that, uh, that, well, think about it. We'll think about it because I'll share with you when we get to Yom Kippur, a little story. You'll have to be there at the, you'll have to be there cold Nidre night. I'll share with you a story of why we're supposed to be happy on Yom Kippur. Anyways, Yom Kippurim. Yom Kippurim, a day like Purim. Anyways, so last time we finished with Tzedek Tzedek Tirdof with Shoftim and Shoftrim. You're supposed to appoint officials and uh, judges. You shall judge fairly, it says. No partiality. Don't take bribes. And the, the line we finish with, we'll finish with, which is justice, justice shall you pursue, which reminds us, as I as I told you, the the commentary on that is it's not an easy thing. We don't take for granted that justice just falls into our laps. We have to pursue it. We have to be vigilant, and we have to uh, do our part in uh, in attaining it. It's not easy. And that's why we really appreciate and are grateful for the people who administer justice in our communities, including law enforcement, including uh, judges, uh, ideally lawyers. I mean, people who are who are taking care of making sure the laws are being applied. So police official, you know, police officials, things like that, uh, generally speaking, should be uh, highly respected and highly regarded. and. Uh, have a huge responsibility, which is why they can't take bribes, why they can't be compromised, why they can't be seen as being compromised. And so when you talk about law enforcement being the assumption being that they're bad, it pretty much undermines the fabric of society. Because if you can't trust the people who are supposed to administer laws, you can't really um, be very confident that your safety or security is, is going to be taken care of. And of course, this week, uh, we remembered 9-11 and uh, the tremendous loss of life to law enforcement uh, on 9-11, which, at, uh, which I think was a day that we came to be recognized as, as a day where we think about um, sacrifices that law enforcement and fire as well, but people who protect us and who uh, should be given uh, respect and thanks for, for what they do. So, uh, and again, I'm not saying they don't have a tremendous responsibility. They do. They have a tremendous responsibility. They need to be extra vigilant in their upholding of the laws. They can't be seen as taking advantage of their position. They can't, you know, it's even worse when they commit crimes. The, the, the standard has to be very high. So um, that's where we finished. And then the next line has nothing to do with that. And as I mentioned before, with Deuteronomy, we have a problem in that we can't really explain why the laws are the way they are. We, we, we will see it today and next week and the week after this constant mish, mishmash potpourri of laws. There are some really important laws here. There are some repeating of laws that we've had earlier on in the Torah. There seems to be this assumption almost that we may not have the earlier parts of the Torah, which is why this is here. By the way, if that's the case, then the fact that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur aren't here means that the people who compiled Deuteronomy didn't really care that we didn't know that. Just keep that in mind. Um, so the next law is, do not, lo tita lecha, don't set up for yourself a sacred post any kind of pole beside the altar of your God Adonai that you may make, 
or erect a stone pillar, bless you, for such God Adonai detests. Now, uh, what is going on here? Why is this so important? Why is this listed? Because this is one of the basic ways that people in the land of Israel, before them, the Canaanites worshiped, bless you, they worshiped with sacred poles, posts that are called Asherah. Um, what does the King James say, Mary? Sacred post? Jesus shall, shall set up the image. Yeah. So they don't go with the sacred post translation. They go that it's actually a statue, an idol. An Asherah was, was a statue. It's possible, but the but the but the next line is Kol Eitz Etzel. So an Eitz is definitely a tree, which is probably the way it translates it, right, Mary? Yeah, so it's a completely different translation. There, 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 the King James is assuming that these are sacred gardens, that these are places where people would worship like tree nymphs and things like that. There, there's later on, and again, probably what this translation is trying to reflect is this idea that they were more like maypoles or they were more like fertility objects, or they were more like some of the cultural, uh, and we discovered them through archaeology, some of the, the worship places that we've discovered it in, in the area, which included these sacred poles. Um, so it wasn't necessarily an idol. Um, it does say a tree. Look, there are people who've said, well, this is kind of an interesting law because wouldn't that, doesn't that cover Christmas trees? Now, I will say that it says specifically by the altar that God makes. Now, I might be splitting hairs or splitting trees, but <laughs> look, the Christmas tree has the same origin. It was a sacred fertility object by people who lived in the north northern part of Europe, where they would take a evergreen tree and they would turn it into a cultic object during the winter months, which is why the Christmas tree got into Christmas in the first place. It has nothing to do with Jesus. Christians will tell you that. I'm not sharing a secret that hasn't been already discussed. Uh, some churches today are, have really frowned on the use of of Christmas trees and pagan uh, symbols in in the uh, in the church in what about church. Uh, also, fertility symbol. Also, fertility symbol. Not a religious symbol. So some churches have frowned on that really? and don't don't like people doing that. Others will say, "Hey, look, it's part of the culture. Let's you know, relax. Don't make it be." And kids have a good time with it. So what are you going to do? Take away their good time? So that's. Uh, that's a little, what? Yeah. Yeah. So again, a lot of the Santa iconography is based on Northern European elves and, and, you know, things that existed before Christianity. Um, but again, they adapted it. Judaism didn't adapt the pole. They didn't adapt the, these kinds of things. We know that Judaism maybe adapted some, well, we think we maybe adapted some things from the Canaanites, but not things like this. Um, I think it kind of makes sense that any kind of imagery of God, they were a little uncomfortable with. That doesn't mean that they didn't have any, because we know the Kruvim that were on top of the ark were, were somewhat anthropomorphic. They were angels. We talked about Ezekiel's vision, question of like, would you build that? You did paint it, but would you build it? That's another question. Um, there definitely is a fear in Judaism of things that could be made into idols. They don't like idols. And Jews generally don't like, we, we don't like three-dimensional objects that could be used as an idol, which is why to this day in Israel, you will not see statues of famous people in Israel's history, ever. It's the only country where you will not see statues. So when people talk about the issue here in the United States of pulling down people's statues, 
and having statues to people who are have problems and have to be re-understood or whatever else, it's never a problem in Israel because no, there is no statue to Golda Meir, there's no statue to David Ben-Gurion, there's no statue to any of these people. It is completely against Jewish tradition. So with Sandy Kopech, religious, he'd be upset with that. With the statue of, I, I don't know. I don't know. He was religious. I don't know. I, I think I think there are people who, uh, it hasn't happened too many times, Mike, in history where people have said, as a Jew, do I feel comfortable with someone having a statue to me? There, there are not many examples of it. I think there's a, there is a statue of, I'm Solomon down at the uh, will, uh, at the uh, Wall Street. I think it's at Wall Street about Jewish finance. It's either it's either there. Or, I think it's there. I'm Solomon statue. Uh, there aren't many Jews that have been enshrined anywhere in statues. Because in other countries we lived in, in Europe, they weren't going to make statues to us. Uh, so yeah, not really. There's a statue of Einstein in D.C. That I've taken pictures with, with it's over by the some science center, uh, science uh, federal science center, and in, in, in these Karl Marx was Jew, true, but I, I don't know. There's there's not many statues of him anywhere anymore. There used to be, but a lot of those statues got taken down. Oh, yeah. exactly. Uh, Einstein. Oh, I, 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 it's the Einstein statue, but it's 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 a very casual. I, I know. Well, he he was not. He was a little religious. I wouldn't say not religious at all. He was more religious than some of his contemporaries, like Oppenheimer and some of the other people that you saw in that movie. Yeah, but the Einstein statue is more like he's on a bench, and it's not like it's not like a huge statue. Anyways, it's not a big it's not a big deal for us. There's not many statues to Jews, which is why it is weird to see the Sandy Koufax statue at Dodger Stadium. I take a picture with my kids in front of that statue, maybe because it is so weird. <laughs> see a statue to a Jewish guy. Plus, it's still it's still kind of new. Anyways, but yeah, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't even put Jews on, on coins. We don't put faces on coins. I shouldn't say Jews. We don't put anybody on coins, which is why Israel doesn't have coins with human images on it or animals. Not even animals? Not even animals. Only flowers. Only images. So... Uh, yeah, you're not supposed to make up any altars. Again, God doesn't like them. Um, the next line is uh, an interesting one. Uh, again, this is the new chapter, but where do you break it? I don't know. I don't know that that's necessarily a good place to break it, because in the middle of talking about religious things, at least these are both religious kind of issues, you shall not sacrifice to your God at I deny an ox or a sheep that has any defect of serious kind, for that is abhorrent to your God, I deny. Now, I, I will say uh, that's not really a great translation, I think. What does your translation, Mary, have for that line? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know that defect of a serious kind really is seen as, I don't know that that's the word serious should be used there. What does yours say, Glory? Not sacrifice to the Lord your God and not to sheep that has any defect or flaw in it. So that would be detestable. Yeah. I, I think serious seems to imply that if it's really bad, <laughs> if it's a bad one, like a little one you can give him. You can give God a little defect, but not a bad defect. I, I don't. I don't think that's really what it's saying. So I don't. I, I don't think that's a great translation. What is? What do you got, John? You know, it's interesting because I mentioned on Tuesday I'm reading this magazine, uh -huh. and um, uh, yeah, he indicates that well, very deep on a lot of things, but he said, you know, God doesn't care about the, uh, the sacrifices. sacrifices. Yeah. He couldn't care less. Um, that's, what he, that's what he analogized. Yeah. He does it because at the time that human beings yeah. um, started to progress, however you want, th those were the the, um, the rituals. Uh, the um, yeah. They, they didn't understand the world. 
right, which goes into detail and going crazy mm -hmm. with pH and the whole thing in regards to that. That's that's the way I. So when I see this, yeah. So yeah, Rambam was a rationalist, and it's one of his most important. I think what John just illustrated was one of Rambam's most important teachings, which is that sacrifices was a developmental stage for worship. He looked at it and said, "Why would God want all these? Yeah. Does God really need this stuff?" So yeah, Maimonides had a great t t take on that, which is that the temple was able to God allowed the t temple to be destroyed when we didn't. God didn't people didn't need to do it anymore not that god didn't need it god never needed it but people didn't need to do it anymore so god allowed people to progress outside of 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 sacrifice any you know and so that was hit one of probably i'd say to some extent i'd say that in his hope that people would not use amulets and magic devices and things like that or his two most important to me his two most important teachings what they understood, what, what made sense to them. Yeah. The world, the currents, the moon, and all. And yeah. So people, yep. So people, people needed that development. Now here, but when we get to that, so why? What do we take away from this? You can still say, though, if if the sheep, or the ox has any defect, you're not supposed to offer it. Because it did say that earlier in, in Leviticus, it talked about not offering up uh, animals that had defect in it. Um, because again, the idea is you don't offer up to God something you're going to toss away anyways, something that has no value. Because if the animal had a, had a defect that you wouldn't eat it or couldn't breed it or anything like that, especially breeding it, right? Because the value in an animal isn't just eating it, it actually is really not at all that's very limited value it was breeding it and if the animal had a defect you didn't breed it and we've been genetically engineering animals for thousands of years tens of thousands of years that's why animals have gotten bigger and why we've gotten bigger and why you know um the animals we're looking at today are not the animals that our ancestors would have seen five four thousand five thousand years ago or even two thousand years ago so he's saying don't give to god something that is of no value to you anyways so i mean we could say the same thing today which is that do we do we give to god or to the people we care about or the you know people in our environment do we give them our worst you know do we give them something that we really don't care about anyways is that really a gift is that really something that we're making is that a sacrifice and so even if you don't believe sacrifice is important that the teaching's important because from this, and I have a feeling my monitor's probably even read some, wrote something about this, which is, but the law teaches us that you don't give to God something that doesn't, you, you don't, you don't offer, there is no sacrifice in something that has no value to you. You're not sacrificing anything. Now, we're going to get into uh, more behavioral issues. Uh, of, um, you're going to see a lot of stuff. If there is found among you in one of the settlements that your God Adonai has given you, a man or woman who has affronted your God Adonai and transgressed the covenant, turning to the worship of other gods and bowing down to them, to the sun or the moon or of the heavenly host, something I never commanded, and you have been informed or have learned of it, then you shall make a thorough inquiry. If it is true, the fact is established that abhorrent thing was perpetrated in Israel. You can guess what's going to happen now. You shall take that man or that woman who did that wicked thing out to a public place, and you shall stone that man or woman to death. Now, this is talking about people that are worshiping. Specifically here, it says people who are worshiping other gods, bowing down to them, or the sun or the moon or the, or the stars. People who are worshiping, not even necessarily a statue. I mean, the sun and the moon, those aren't statues. Those are things that exist all the time. But those things can become idols, and you're not supposed to be doing that either. Now, again, by our standards today, this sounds really, really intolerant. Let's put it that way. But remember, they're not just talking about the fact that people 
would worship a god that was the moon or the god was the sun. But what they were doing as part of that worship, which oftentimes, as we're going to read, included human sacrifice. So how do you separate that? You separate that by saying our God never asks for human sacrifice. And on top of that, you say that any of the religions that do have human sacrifice, we aren't even dabbling in it. We're not saying that that's okay at all. Now, what are the limits to this? Because there have to be limits to this. There has to be limits. They just put the limit or one of the limits. So that if it was perpetrated in Israel, the ways Americans see pagans, I don't have a right to kill them. <laughs> yeah. That's true. In our home, not just anywhere. That's why we weren't war mongers. We weren't conquerors. Yeah. But one thing, though, and for those who've been to Israel with us, we'll tell you, this is on the ground in almost every synagogue we've ever found in Israel. That happens to be Beit Alpha, which is not one of the best examples of great, this is almost like childish mosaic, but it's uh, very well preserved in the sense that it's a complete mosaic, with the exception of a little bit of, of uh, Taurus down there that's been knocked out. And the fact that I even know that that, oh, that's not Taurus, actually, that's Taurus at the time. But the fact that we know the, constel, we know the constellations that well, that we can just see them and we know what they are, tells you that uh, we've never, this is all familiar to us still. So, um, yeah, that's on not just one synagogue, that's virtually every ancient synagogue that we found that are roughly, and these aren't ancient, these aren't biblical ancient, but they're 2,000-year-old ancient. They're still ancient by American standards, but by uh, Israel, uh, ancient Israel standards, these don't necessarily go back to the to the to the to the Book of Deuteronomy. But how did 500 years later Jews do that? And these aren't random Jews. These are Jews that put together the synagogues, and they're the people who are the rabbis. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't have an issue with this. Well, because what's the point of it? Well. What it's definitely teaching us is that there is a. Because isn't that just because isn't that basic joke? It's just observations of this is this constellation looks kind of like this thing. Yeah. And in this month, the sun rises in that constellation. Yeah. Interesting. Like they're not worshiping. What's the date of the year? This this synagogue is uh, this synagogue is. The, Bait Alpha. No, we went to Tsipori. I'll show you the, the, the Tsipori one. This one was the Bait Alpha, the Bait Alpha synagogue was they just go, it's Byzantine, so it's it's uh it's 1500 years old, 1600, 1500, 1600 years old. Um, I'll show you the the Tsipori one. Um which you, which you, which most of you saw, just isn't. As, it's more, it's more beautiful, but um, it's it's not quite as. There's pieces of it that are missing. There's too much of it that's missing. Yeah, you saw this one. This one's. I mean, look at the difference. This is high def, and the other one's like, it's like Atari from fifty years, forty years ago. No, this is. You can see it's gorgeous. I mean, look at the, you look at, and it is high definition because the tiles are very small, but it's the same stuff. It's the same constellations, right? It's got, the, and it's got it, by the way, what's interesting about it here at Tsipori is it's got, you know, it's got Keshet, it's got Sagittarius, but it also has the Hebrew month of Kislev. It ha, and by the way, it has by the Hebrew name. It doesn't have, it doesn't say, it doesn't say, uh, it says, uh, you know, it says, uh, you know, I'll show you one you can read real well. Well, well, you can see the Keshet. That's the that means the Bowman. That's the the Bowman, and it says Kislev, which is when we have Hanukkah. Um, you can see you can see uh, Scorpio, pretty clear. It says Akrav, which is a uh, scorpion, and then it has the money the month down there at Cheshvan. But you can see. So here's the deal, though. Here's what I want to show you, and I. 
can, I'll show you back at the, well, I can show you on this one too. The issue is, is that both on both on both of them, they don't just have the zodiac, they have Helios, the sun god in the middle. There's the sun and there's Helios driving the chariot. It also has in the corners, the four, the four winds, which are the four seasons, which the seasons actually line up. So the four seasons, you know, the four seasons cover those, the, the, the three months of that quarter are underneath that, those winds. So that's the, that's the winter months with the winter, uh, winter seasons. And, and there's the fall and the spring and the summer. So you can see that each, each wind covers three months. It's beautiful. Uh, what's interesting too, is that if you see here, this is a perfect example. That's got the seasons in Greek. <laughs> That's the seasons written in Greek letters, right? So you have Greek letters here and Hebrew letters. And there's Greek right in here. So what does that, what does that imply? That implies that you had a pretty good fusion of Greco-Roman culture by the rabbis who were very well aware of what the Torah said. You can see that they didn't have an issue with it. The boundaries of the boundaries of having other gods or having they didn't feel that this was a form of idolatry. Now, two things. It's not a statue. It's technically, even though it, it, I know somebody's going to say it's three-dimensional, it's not really three-dimensional. It's considered two-dimensional art. So it was not a statue. The rabbis are pretty strict against statues. Statues are not okay with them. They don't like statues. But the, uh, the pictures, they don't seem to be very upset with. And it's not just that it's in Sipori. It's the synagogue floor. The other art on the synagogue floor is religious Jewish art, it's depicting things from the Bible. But yet every synagogue has the zodiac. Now, why? Because it's showing the months. This one actually, by the way, you can actually make out some of the symbols. Over here, it has symbols for the holidays. The calendar. It's a calendar. Exactly. It's a calendar. It's showing people what do we do over the course of the year. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful work of art showing us the year. They had no issue with it. So there were limits to this, folks. There, there is no question that this law is not, they didn't see this as violating that law. So people ask me, why am I making an issue of this anyways? Because people ask me all the time, is, what does Judaism say about astrology? Right? What does it say about astrology? Now, one of the things that we have to remember is that during the rabbinic period, astrology was not seen as a form of idolatry or polytheism. It was not seen that way. As a matter of fact, there was a belief that the stars did tell us the future in the sense that stuff was playing out in the stars. Whether or not, again, understanding or accepting that idea, that's why we say it's written in the stars. There was some destiny that was, that was following this type of cycle that went through the sky. Now, there's a difference between thinking that you could influence those events by worshiping mm. those powers. And that's the fine line that Judaism took with astrology. There was no separation between astrology and astronomy. They were no, there was no differentiation between those studies. They were the same. The people who studied the stars were the same people who would tell you they were hired by the kings to figure out what was going to happen. And that's how we determined planetary movement. That's how we eventually learned about the universe at the basic level was by people who were essentially hired by kings to figure out what's going to happen. 
even if even that even th though that that was the case that they were wrong they 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 were able to still figure out a system that worked so you can you know we can say well they were stupid they thought the world was flat they thought that the earth was the center of the universe they still came up with a calendar that worked no i know but i'm just saying they were wrong but they still were able to create a system that worked to be fair was highly likely they knew it was round Eratosthenes proved their circumstances. people yes people knew and had talked about it there's no question but there were still people that were affirming that the earth was not or if or if it wasn't flat it was curved but it, there were ends to it and that's the problem that like we 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 diminish it by saying they were wrong without acknowledging the fact that even though they were wrong they figured out seasons they figured out how to plant they figured out how to calculate eclipses they figured out they figured out meteors and they figured out when there were going to be there were going to be certain uh when you'd when you'd see a a comet i mean they they knew these things so yes their their systems were flawed but they still were able to create calendars and and information that was working for them again i have a feeling that in the future people are going to look at us and say they were really stupid they didn't understand <laughs> yes right star trek that's right dorian <laughs> they were they were cutting into people like barbarians you hear mccoy going crazy with they cut into this they cut into these people back then so um yeah so people, people, uh, yeah, people are going to laugh at us one day. I hope. One day? I hope. I hope. I hope. Yeah. So you can at least do something uh, with the planets as long as you're not worshiping them. Uh, and again, the, the, the heavenly hosts are the constellations. Uh, heavenly hosts. Yeah. I was going to say, does not show the Jewish idea of like, behavioralism is like we don't care what you're thinking but this is what you have to do and the whole of who we keep the focus on yeah because the issue is saying like oh because our god is immaterial he's not a physical thing like that rock up in the sky is but he put that there which means there's a reason for it and i could discern that if i were to try whereas the astrology people like up today think oh since i was born in whatever month Horus decides how i am like, well, that means you're giving the random, you know, this random pictogram authority over you. Yes. So you're taking away your own agency, which is, I know, what most of my Christian friends have a problem with astrology, is take away your own agency. Yes. Well, we would say that Judaism tried to get people not to be worshiping or putting themselves subservient to anything other than God, a God that didn't look like a person, a God that didn't behave like a person. Or to the physical. Now, it's not easy. And so, again, people figured accommodations as well, as long as it didn't get them into a, a bad space. But astrology or astrological terms still find their way into Jewish sources through the Kabbalistic period. It's not so much today. You don't hear, I would say most people today in, in traditional Judaism will say, we don't put a lot of stock into astrology. Now, when you execute these people who are doing this bad worship, this is really critical. A person, and this now goes away from the religious a little bit to law and civil procedure, if you will. A person shall be put to death only by the testimony of two or more witnesses. And the little asterisk there says it's two or three witnesses, but, but more than two. Uh, no one shall be put to death on the testimony of a single witness. That's a critical idea in Judaism, which is you better make sure you have witnesses. And the Talmud goes even further, which is you need to have witnesses to the witnesses, and even more so, witnesses to the witnesses to the witnesses who can verify you know, the veracity and the, and the truth of the witnesses. So it's very, very, very strict. When it gets to the Talmudic period, 
putting someone to death was virtually impossible unless there was, you know, you had a bulletproof case and you had testimony that was unimpeachable. Very hard to do. And there's no mention of prosecution. Not here, but the fact that there are two witnesses allows the rabbis to extrapolate from that that we had to do even more because it's really the two or more. And so that's what scared them. The Torah opens up, so the Torah gives us the death penalty, no question, but it also gives us this, in the back of our minds, we better make really sure that when we execute somebody, it's legitimate. And so that two or more makes it so that Eventually, you have like 80 people deciding a minimum of 80 people that are involved in a death penalty case. 80 people. 81, actually, to be precise. It's a lot. So witnesses, testimony, all the kinds of things that would go into a court, are they're, they're in the Talmud. I mean, the, the tractate Sanhedrin, which is about courts, begins with this discussion about how many people are needed to decide a case you have the you have the witnesses you have the witnesses the witnesses the witness and then you have the the, the court itself the judges because they didn't have one judge this idea that we have one judge it's not an it's not a it's not a, a normal dis, way of dispensing justice just so you know a jury system is also not a normal system of dispensing justice. Multiple people that have to decide these cases is, but not a jury of your peers. By the way, if you've ever seen a jury of your peers, you don't want those people deciding your fate. Trust me, anything but that. Seriously. Um, scary. So... Um, and there's no difference necessarily between impaneling a, a jury for a murder trial or for a trial of a much lesser crime. It'd be the same pool of people. Seems to me like at least Judaism understands that no, there's a, there, there's a standard not only of evidence, but also a standard of, of responsibility that has to go into deciding a, a life or death case for someone. So on top of that, the Torah tells us, let the hands of the witnesses be the first to put the condemned to death, followed by the hands of the rest of the people. Thus you will sweep out evil from your midst. So the people had to be there for the execution, which is, of course, the way it was for much of human history. If there was an execution, it was public. Um, seems pretty brutal, seems pretty bloodthirsty, but it's not really, because it's also telling people that you're responsible for these executions. If they're going to be taken out, taken care of, you, it's on you. You can't hire somebody to do it for you. It's not going to be done in darkness. It's going to be done in front of everybody. And number one, hopefully it will teach you a lesson. But number two, you better be really sure that the person you're executing did, did what they did. All I'm saying is, it's not quite as simple as you'd think it was. When you see those Western movies where they're hanging somebody, you go, oh, this, this is terrible. There's kids, there's women, there's you know, people watching this execution. It's based on this idea that we have that the community is responsible for this. And the hope is that it will stop it from happening. More civil. If a case is too baffling for you to decide, and that, by the way, was civil and religious because that was a religious punishment, but look at this. If a case is too baffling for you to decide, be it a controversy over homicide, civil law, or assault. It's good. Matters of dispute in your courts you shall promptly repair to the place that your God Adonai will have chosen and appear before the Levitical priests or the magistrate in charge at the time and present your problem. When they have announced to you the verdict in the case, 
You shall carry out that verdict that is announced to you from that place that Adonai chose, observing scrupulously all the instructions to you. So that is telling us in a very simple way that there is a Supreme Court. There is a court where people appeal or take cases to that they can't decide at a local level. Of course, this is Jerusalem. That's whenever, whenever Deuteronomy says a place that God will choose for you, that's Jerusalem. But that's also a place of justice. The city itself is a place of justice. Now, what's interesting here, it is not the king that does this. It is not the hereditary leader of the people that does this. It is the priests, and it, or it is uh, a shofet. Magistrate, I don't love that translation. I know that's not your translation, Mary. What does your translation say? Not a judge. And Glory? Uh, judge. Yeah. A shofet is a judge. Almost always. Now, magistrate maybe is maybe a more effective term in the sense that there are countries where they have a magistrate and they're like a judge. But that's not what the word means in Hebrew. A judge in the Bible was a leader who was seen as essentially ruling with God's permission, very much like a king, but not a king, because he's not a hereditary person. He was a person, as we read in the book of Shoftim, the book of Judges, who was chosen because they had a divine gift. So this isn't just some random guy. This isn't some person who was born into it. These are, this is a person who's actually a legitimate um, enforcer of higher authority, God's authority. We don't have an exact equivalent to that, but it was the time before they had a king. They had, shof, they had a shofa, they had shoftim, they had judges. Um, it's a little bit, it's a little bit what. What Judge Dredd is based on the, the comic. And, and so, so this is pretty interesting because, right, this Deuteronomy is written. They, they 600, 600 BC, yeah. During Exodus. No, well, maybe, right. but we also believe it could have been written by Josiah and his people. 600, so 600 years later. But, the time we're reading about. 700. Yeah. Right? But it was, but there was experience, right? Like yeah. Exodus. Yeah. So they had experience with yes with people. Yes. And this was their yes. It's pretty interesting, right? Like, What's interesting is we know well. One of the reasons why we believe that this was written later is because it takes into consideration that you have a central place, Jerusalem, and we're actually going to see now they're going to tip their hand when they're writing this in about a couple lines. You'll see exactly how we know when this was written. But there was a time when the Jews, for a couple hundred years after Moses, they come into the land and they're ruled by Joshua, who's the first judge, and the other judges who come after him. Those are Deborah and people like Samson. These are people who have divine power, really, in a way. They're given like special time. They're like, they're given a... a they're 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 not just random people. They were chosen by God to some extent to have this kind of power. So maybe <laughs> maybe uh, you shall act in accordance with the tradition with the instructions, the Torah. I'll P Torah on the word of the Torah or the instructions of the teachings given you and the ruling handed down to you. You must not deviate from the verdict that they announced to you either to the right or to the left. Should either party distribute d- dispute uh, to the dispute act presumptuously and disregard the priest charged with serving there, your God out an eye or the magistrate, that party should die. Thus you will sweep, shall sweep evil from Israel. All the people will hear and be afraid and will not 
act presumptuously again. So you're going to follow what the decisions that they come up with. And if you don't, and the person tries not to, you're going to kill that person, even if, by the way, the, the, the charge or the decision wasn't a death penalty. A person could be charged with death if they didn't follow what the what the judge came up with. So if the judge said you're punished and this is what your punishment shall be, you're, you, you're wrong, you're going to be punished, and the person ran away, so I'm not going to follow that, then they could be killed. Because again, they're undermining the legal system. And that was enough to have somebody be done away with because you're going to sweep out evil from Israel. All the people will be afraid here and be afraid and not act presumptuously again. It's going to help their behavior. Now, let's get to the point where they tip their hand. If after you have entered the land that your God Adonai has assigned to you and taken possession of it and settled in it, and you decide, I will set a king over me, as do all the nations about me. You shall be free to set a king over yourself, one chosen by your God, Adonai. Be sure to set as king over yourself, one of your own people. You must not set a foreigner over you, one who is not your kin. So, this seems to assume that there's a king of Israel, or king of Judah, a Jewish king. Now, it's not a king that you get to choose. It's a king that God chooses. And when we read in the Bible about the first kings, like Samuel and then David, I mean Saul, Saul and David, Samuel is the one who makes them kings. He is God's prophet. He's God's judge. Samuel is both a prophet and a judge and a priest. He's a Levite. He, he, um, he does, though, he does though, that work under God's direction. He makes Saul king, and then God says, I'm done with Saul, and he makes David king. So, kings, what does it tell us? In Deuteronomy, it says that there's going to be kings. It doesn't say that earlier. Does that mean the other parts of the Torah were written before they were kings? Most people don't say that. Most people say that those were also written after there was King David. We don't know that for sure. But people who study this say that maybe Leviticus is from 200 years earlier, from about the 800s. David would always already have been king. We don't know. We don't know for sure. We can't date it by that. We don't date Deuteronomy by that either. The reason we think Deuteronomy was written at the time of King Josiah is because it seems to have been written right before the exile. And it seems to be written with something that's going to be, we're going to read right now, that tells us that the person who wrote this knew how badly the kings had screwed up. And what we know about is that Josiah is a good king who's very close to the priests and who fixes what his ancestors didn't do in the first place. First of all, the person's not supposed to be from another people. What does that tell us? It tells us that other people did that. It wouldn't be there unless it happened. So there is the possibility that people in the ancient world did something that we know people did in the modern world which is bring in kings from other places to rule them. Why? Well, maybe because they didn't trust their own people. Maybe they didn't think that there was anyone left in the country that they could really, that the people would get behind. All we know is that it's happened, and it's happened in more, much more recent history. Because it happened in England when the English brought over William and Mary from Holland to, to be their king, William of Orange. It happened when, and that was their choice, the English. It happened when they brought over, to some extent, they knew exactly what part of the royal family they were getting when they brought, they brought in uh, the Battenbergs, who changed their name to Mountbatten. They were German. 
And everyone knew they were German. But they had no issue with it. They were people that they, 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 they liked them. So people do that. They bring in people who don't even speak their language very well. Um, Sovereignty. I'm thinking about if you're a vassal state like Israel was after the Palestinians came in. Effectively, the Hebrews would have listened to Caesar. Effectively, he was king. He was emperor, pilot. He was emperor then. So, so, uh, yes. Your point is, what so is? If Israel becomes not sovereign, right? If they start answering to other people, then they're not a sovereign people. Uh, it would definitely was an issue, um, and it was an issue to the Jews. Um, it was an issue to this country. It was very much an issue, exactly. So we were just gonna we were gonna get to that part, but we can jump to that part right now. Which John, no, tell us the law. Yeah. Not just a citizen. A native born citizen of this country. You have, you have to be born in this country, which was a law at a time when a lot of people still weren't born in this country. Or if they had been, they'd only been here, their families had been here one or two generations. So that was an important law in our country. And if you don't think it's based on this, <laughs> come on, come on. Because the Romans didn't care. They didn't, Romans didn't care if the emperor of Rome, the Caesar, was born in Rome. Sometimes it, sometimes the guy was, and sometimes it helped. I'm not saying it didn't wasn't irrelevant, but it was more for a political stamp, whether you had the support of the Roman, you know, the Roman citizens or the Roman, more importantly, the Roman, the Roman Senate, those the you know, the imperial court. But but the reality is, is that they didn't care. They, they had a lot of Roman emperors, a lot of Caesars that were born outside of, of Rome. Um, so here is an interesting uh, thing, though, back to, back to the last time we had Jewish, uh, the last time we had Jewish um, kings. Um, here is the last time we had, a, uh, last time this happened. So, as Jesse said, during the Roman period, this is the last Jewish kings. You had uh, Alexander, who was part of Alexander Janaeus, who was part of the, the Maccabean dynasty, the Hasmonean dynasty. He had a daughter named Miriam, who was married to this guy, Herod the Great. Not such a great dude, but he was still called Herod the Great. Well, um, uh, Herod had a son with him named Aristobulus, Judas Aristobulus. Um, he, uh, he actually, uh, I see the problem. Still yeah, you can see the problem. <laughs> well, you can see this is the, these are the last Jewish kings. You can see they're all named Herod. He, you know, Herod, Herod liked uh, his name a lot and he, uh, he named his kids uh, after himself to some extent. Um, yeah, like George Foreman. But here's Herod Archelaus. That was one of his sons. Um, there's Miriam. Um, but you can see, so the last king, the last kings that are Jewish kings, they didn't even rule over much of, 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 uh, of Israel. This here's Herod Agrippa. And here, here's like, well, that's not a picture of him because we don't really know what he looked like. But he was actually, he was actually the 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 uh, he was actually the la one of the last Jewish kings. So it says he died at seventy during the time of Trajan, about one hundred, um, and he was the last ruler of the dynasty. So I showed you his ancestry. I showed you how he was related. There's a very famous story about him in the Talmud, and he was the he was again not really a king over. He wasn't really a king over uh, the, the, the area of Jerusalem. You can see he had 
the northern part of, of Israel, but he did not have a rule over Jerusalem. He wasn't, he wasn't in charge of Jerusalem. Um, he, he, that, wasn't his, that wasn't part of his uh, territory. But there's a very famous story in the Talmud, which is a beautiful story, which is that Herod Agrippa was reading the Torah. And he was reading the book of Deuteronomy, where it says, you shall not place a foreign king over yourself. And it says that when he got to that verse, he started crying. And the Jews told him, the Jewish people who were okay with him, said to him, it's okay, Herod, we consider you a Jew. But he realized that his existence, to some extent, was illegitimate. Now, again, we don't know the story for sure happened. We, you know, we, we, we can't definitively say um, uh, that, you know, that it actually happened. And to some extent, he was, it, was, it was immaterial what, what, he, uh, what he did, because I'm going to show you right now. This was the territory that he reigned over. This is the Sea of Galilee. This, would Her this was Herod Agrippa's territory. This is the Golan Heights. That's the, that's, it says Golanitis. It goes into Syria. That was his territory. It's not here. That's Israel. So the last Jewish king technically wasn't even king over Jewish territory. That's the irony of that. But it says that, you know, he understood to some extent his illegitimacy because Herod himself was not a Jew. Herod was descendant of Edomians, an Edomite, and even though he had Jewish ancestry as well, his, his, he was ruling through Herod, who Herod wasn't a Jew. So, uh, it did happen. And thank you, Jesse, for reminding us of that. What? No, Edomites are descendants of Esau. They're our cousins. They're Semitic, but they're not Israelite. They are descendants of Abraham. They're even descendants of Isaac. They're just not descendants of Jacob. So uh, this was an important law. And it, as John said, it's an important law for us as American too, because we believe that perhaps a person who is not of our people would have an allegiance to somebody else, to the place that they came to, came from before. I mean, English just had that issue right uh, yeah. On the other hand, yeah. But you know what England just did? It wasn't necessarily a smooth election, but they have a person who's uh, the Prime Minister of England now, who's not ethnically English. Was he born in England? What? He was born in England. Yeah. I mean, he considered himself English nationality-wise, but he's he's Indian. Yeah, Rishi Sunak is. Prime he's prime minister. Really? Yeah, Rishi Rishi Sunak. Oh. He's he's the current prime minister of England. So England. Um, I mean, that would be kind of different though, because he's not the state. He's the king, basically. I I that's true, that's but when you have a but but, you know, I mean. All I'm telling you is, we'll see. We'll see if America can wrap their head around. We may have a we we may have a similar decision in a, in a, in a, a year whether we're re, whether we're ready to elect somebody who is not ethnically English, has some English ancestry to him. Because guess what? Even Barack Obama had English North European ancestry. So let's see. Who knows? I don't know. We have two. We have two candidates. We have two candidates who have Indian ancestry. I'm pretty open. Yeah. I don't. I'm different generation. Yeah. I know. So. I know, but guess what? You're not going to be president, and you know who else is not going to be president? Anybody else who's Jewish. That I can tell you. Yeah. I can tell you that in 2024 we still won't have a Jewish president. By the way, you know who will have a Jewish president by 2024? Mexico. So Mexico will have a Jewish president before we do. Hasta la vista.
<laughs> so yeah. What's the, what's the thing? Pardon me. What's the what's the thing? What's the what? What's his name? What's her name? Oh, I didn't even know. That. See, Doreen, you assumed it was a man. That's how it runs. No, I know. Well, she's so what's her she, name? Claudia Scheinbaum. Sounds pretty oh. Jewish, doesn't it? She's gonna be the next. I mean, barring some kind of weird fluke, which could happen, it's Mexico. But uh, yeah, the next president is gonna be a, a Jewish woman. The other. Oh, there's not. The the the. Anyways, it's an interest. She was the mayor of Mexico City, and uh, she's pretty much been handpicked by the current. And that's <laughs> what's going to happen. Anyways, I just think it's interesting, you know, that Mexico had a will have a Jewish leader before we will. Uh, there you go. Anyways, um, I congratulated Daniel Lasani from our synagogue, who's Mexican, and he said. I don't think I don't think she's very religious. Is what he said. I said I don't care. At least they have a. At least they're going to have a Jewish. Pre at least they can wrap their head around it. Yeah. What did he say? He said I don't think she's. I don't think she. I don't think she's practice. She's that practicing. I said yeah. I said who would have thought Mexico would have a Jewish president before America? Anyways, uh, now let's get back to the king, because the king did all these things by the time that this was probably given to us as a reminder not to do. Moreover, he shall not keep many horses or send people back to Egypt to add to his horses. Since Adonai has warned you, you must not go back that way again. And he shall not have many wives, lest his heart go astray, nor shall he amass silver and gold to excess." This was a description of King Solomon to a T. This is literally a slam of King Solomon, who did all of these things, including, as you know, having many wives, becoming very wealthy, but also going back to Egypt to get chariots and horses. Now, what also I think is interesting about this is the fact that they slammed Egypt. Because they didn't have to slam Egypt. If you if you just said don't amass a lot of horses, um, that'd be one thing. But they actually said Egypt. First of all, we let's assume that Solomon did get his horses from Egypt. That's where people would have gotten horses three thousand years ago. But what's interesting is that they slammed Egypt, and that's very relevant because King Josiah, who we believe is responsible for Deuteronomy was killed by the Egyptian army. Why? Because he was fighting with the Babylonians against the Egyptians. Remember, he had signed a deal with the Babylonians. He was trying to be a good Babylonian vassal, if you will, and fought against the Egyptians, and the Egyptians killed him in battle. So if it wasn't written by Josiah or Josiah's court, it could have very well been written around that time when people like Josiah and as we read for the last several months, Jeremiah and his group hate Egypt. And Jeremiah said himself, don't go back to Egypt, which is why the fact that they took him down to Egypt was so tragic and so ironic and so horrible because Jeremiah and his people did not want to go back to Egypt. You must not go back that way again. There's no reason to throw that in there other than that little clue as to when this was written and to what was on the mind of the people who wrote this. We know Josiah was a good king. And what do we know about him? When he is seated on his royal throne, he shall have a copy of this teaching written for him on a scroll by the Levitical priests. It literally just told us what happened. You remember in the book of Kings? When they found the scroll? Come on. It just told us what happened. It's a circular discussion because we know exactly what happened. They found the scroll. Josiah finds the scroll. He takes the scroll. He reads from the scroll. And he makes sure that people keep the scroll. Now, our ancestors have maintained or would tell you 
for the most part, that the scroll is everything that's in that scroll in the Torah. But it also says, see the note here. No, that's, that's not the translation of it. Um, yes, but look at the Hebrew here. It says not just the Torah, Hazot, that would be this. It says Mishneh HaTorah, which is this copy of the Torah. But that's not what your translation says, does it, Mary? Okay, well, that's pretty close to the same. What does yours say, Glory? Yeah, pretty much Mishneh there is also copy. Here's the problem. The word Mishneh could mean copy, but it also could mean this summary or this repetition or this version. And I actually like the word version as a better translation. This version of the teaching. However you want to understand that, the word Mishneh Torah the word Mishneh Torah, the words, it's two words, Mishneh Torah. The words Mishneh Torah. Um, Mine actually said, yes, he is right for himself. Um, well, th that's even more... That's even more uh, definitive, right? But when we look at when we look at when we look at um, when we look at the word um, Mishneh Torah, that is guess what? The other name for this book. So we actually call Deuteronomy in he well in Hebrew the name the other name for this book is Mishneh Torah. Mm -hmm. We call it Devarim, right? Um, but what does the word Deuteronomy mean in Greek? It means a second telling. It means a second telling. That's what the word Deuteronomy means. The word Deuteronomy means Mishneh Torah, a repetition of the Torah, another version of it, another telling. So we say, well, it's Moses' telling. But again, what's interesting about that phrase, Mishneh Torah, to retell the Torah, is exactly what seems to be happening here in this book. Rambam, Maimonides, his main book is called the Mishneh Torah as well, his commentary. He specifically wanted it known as the Mishneh Torah. It's also called the Yad Chazakah, which is the strong hand. It also is Yud Dalad because it's 14 chapters, 14 uh, uh, sections. But, um, but it's called the Mishneh Torah. These are repetitions or retellings of the Torah. And what does it say again? Let it remain with him and let him read it all his life so that he may learn to revere his God, Adonai, to observe faithfully every word of this teaching as well as these laws. And there again, the word is kol divrei ha-Torah ha-Zot, and the laws. Now, again, for us, that's been the whole Torah. It's not just the book of Deuteronomy. But it's very possible that at least in the book of Deuteronomy's mind, it is the book of Deuteronomy. And that's why people have said that this book is a unique book. And it's a book that to some extent was the code and the covenant for the king and for the people at that time. Why was it so important at that time? Because they knew that the Babylonian destruction was a possibility. They knew that they had to, to some extent summarize and recontextualize their history up to that point, because they knew that things were about, 
Maybe they didn't know for sure it was going to go south, but Jeremiah was around there going, it's going to go south. We know because we read the book of Jeremiah. We also know that people just looked at the political situation and saying, things are going to hell. We better put down these laws really quickly and make sure we know what they are. Guess what? We did the same thing 600 years later when we wrote the Mishnah, which is also a version of Mishneh, to retell, to tell again. The rabbis who wrote down the oral law 600 years later said, we better write this down because the Romans are burning everything down. And if they burn down and kill all of the rabbis, no one's going to know what they've been teaching us for the last several hundred years. So let's write it down. And they were not supposed to write it down. The oral law was supposed to be oral. But they said, well, we can either follow that tradition that we have an oral law and it'll be destroyed, or we can write it down and make sure we can still have it. And it seems like Leviticus, like all the laws in Leviticus, all the laws of Numbers, even the laws, the, the laws that are in, in Exodus, that the people who were there at the time said, we better get these laws into a way for us to keep them and for a scroll that a person can take with them. And more importantly, I guess for us right now, that the king has to rule by them. Now, if, if we were worried about the, the rabbis being killed, and so they put it for law and written law, weren't they worried about the books that they were writing? Them? Yes, but they could hide them. And they did hide them. They put them in caves, and we found them 2,000 years later. And we didn't find that group didn't keep so much the they didn't keep the Talmud, they kept their own books. But the rabbis did the same thing. The difference was is that they went to Babylonia. They went outside of Israel. They took their stuff with them to Egypt and to everywhere else so that even if the place got destroyed, their books weren't going to get destroyed. Their, their, their Mishnah wasn't going to be destroyed. Now, what's so interesting about this is that the king has to observe the law. Now, this is, again, almost unheard of, because kings did have law codes. We know there's the Code of Hammurabi. I'm not going to say kings didn't have codes, but the code was the Code of Hammurabi. It wasn't the Code of God. The code was Hammurabi's code because Hammurabi liked these laws. Whether or not the king likes these laws, they're the laws, and he has to follow the laws. And as a matter of fact, the Bible itself just told us the king's not going to like these laws because the laws say he can't amass wealth. He can't amass wives. He can't just take horses and make an army out of them. He has to follow the rules. So the laws themselves tell us that the king may not like these laws, but the king is subservient to the laws. We don't know of any other culture. We don't know of any other people that basically said that the king doesn't get to make up his own rules. The king has to follow the rules, has to revere God, which means he has to remember there's something over him, and that he has to fulfill the teachings of these laws. It says right here, thus he will not act haughtily toward his fellows or deviate from the instruction to the right or the left, to the end that he and his descendants may reign long in the midst of Israel. The king is accountable to the law. That's such an important idea in Judaism. Because if the king can make up any law he wants, there's no system of justice. There's no law. It's the will of one person. It's interesting because in the notes in my yeah by Josiah yes yeah because they're tell they're telling you they're telling you that Josiah did what his great 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 grandfather, 10 generations before him didn't do, which was get rid of the altars that Solomon's wives brought into the country. And so Josiah was a good king, even though his dad wasn't good, even though his sons weren't good. He did the right thing. But he did the right thing as far as the priests were concerned, because he did rule 
by their guidance and by the guidance of the Torah. But he is unique in this to some extent. Again, there was really only Hezekiah, as we looked at, over a 150-year period. There weren't many kings that were doing what was right, but he did what was right. And so when it this, this vision of a king sitting on a royal throne with a copy of the teaching of the scroll by the Levitical priests, if that's not a description of Josiah, we don't, I mean, come on. That's literally telling us that's Josiah. So that's why most of us today say that this was the product of this time. If it wasn't, and again, Jewish tradition has it that this was written during the time of Moses, that was what they were supposed to do, and then they didn't do it. So regardless, this is a key idea. Um, look, if, if, a, if a ruler isn't accountable to the laws, they can do what, what Putin did, which is, I'm just going to keep making myself. They had term limits in Russia. Russia had term limits. He was only allowed to do two four-year terms as prime minister, and then he went and ran, he was the president, and then he came back and said, I'm going to come back and be prime minister, and I'm going to change the law again to let myself come back for two terms, and now he's basically changed the law so he can go back for 2030 through 2036. So there's nothing to stop somebody from keeping a run. And again, we had it in our country. We had a president who decided, you know, he wanted to be going against the Constitution and got himself elected for four terms. I mean, the Constitution prohibited that. It, pro it prohibits it. It prohibited it before, and then it prohibits it again. But we literally said as a country, we're in the midst of a war, and the justification was we were going to do what every other country does, which is essentially submit ourselves to... Uh, I th no, I think that the 10-year term was before, because it, for sure it was, because because uh, Teddy Roosevelt couldn't do it. That's why Teddy Roosevelt wasn't going to be able to run. So it was, it was 40 years before. They changed it. 100% they changed it, and then they changed it back. Look it up. I'll t I'll, they, ch they, cha they changed it in, in 1940, so he could, so he could run. Well, he didn't make that law. No, no, it wasn't during Washington's time. It was about 100 years later. It became the term limit was spelled out for two terms. Maybe it wasn't even 100 years later that it was spelled out. You had to, you couldn't do more than two terms or 10 years. Yeah, so if you, someone served what the third term, then I'm running for the fourth when they were like, no. So you can't, you couldn't do that. Now we've changed it back. But we, we did have it and it, it got changed. So we had. You know, look, they, they added more people to the Supreme Court to essentially pass those laws. So, you, you know, we've stretched the limits to what is allowed in our country, and we did it during wartime. And I guess the justification would be that it was emergencies and whatever. And look, we know that Abraham Lincoln suspended the Constitution as well. It was a fact. I mean, it's not necessarily the part of Lincoln history that we like to talk about, but he suspended the Constitution. That was a big deal. It was a big deal. It was a big deal. It's one of the it was a violation of the Bill of Rights. So people would say it's a foundational law. Now, again, did people say it was a, it was it was a necessary thing, whatever. But but look, if you if if the law isn't supreme, then you know, what do we have? And so the guidance of the law is why I would say this law right here is, again, one of those things where we, where we, we talk about why is the United States so Jewish, it's because of this. The concept that, that our system is guaranteed by a legal code, the Constitution, is so important to us because the Constitution to us as Americans is like the Torah is for us as Jews. The only people who understand that, I think, are Jews. So I think Americans, to some extent, we call it a Judeo-Christian country, but that concept is, is primarily Judeo. The idea that the law is supreme is a Jewish concept. It's from this. It's from the Torah itself, which says that you have to, the king even has to follow it. 
And part of it is so they will not act haughtily toward their fellows. Now, um, you can have, what John, what's your translation for act haughtily? What does it say there for verse 20? Lest he will not act haughtily. Oh, so they say, yeah. Yeah, you have, you have the same thing. Glory, what does yours say? Uh, not consider himself better. Above, above. yeah. Yeah, I like that translation better. Mary, what does yours say? Yeah, and that's the literal translation. Room, room, love, ava. Love, you know, lev means heart, right? So room means to elevate, to, to put up higher. That's a good translation because it includes everyone, whereas fellows and not consider himself better than his brothers. Right? So it's all male. Well, th that's the translation of achav, which is brothers. So fellows, you know, it's his peers, you know, the people around him, you know, the everybody else. The other people, other people. I mean, achav, when we say brothers, we oftentimes don't literally mean brothers, but, you know, that's why they have fellows. But the point is, is that elevating themselves above other people. And this is an important idea, which we're discussing right now in this country, which we've been discussing a lot over the last few years, is what are the limits of what a person can do when they're in the office of president? And this is a discussion that we're having right now. And we seem to be stuck in that moment which I hope eventually we figure out a way to move on from that. But that's where we are right now. You're a story. So, so if you're, so, so John, 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 if you're a historian, there's no question. You can, you, you can read, no, 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 wait a second. You can read this, the history. I love the history. I love presidential history. I love reading those stories, right? We, I got a whole library full of presidential biographies a book actually called the failures of, of you know like a failure of every president that's not the point the point is is that we are now we because of our news cycle and because of the way we're hyper focused on on this right now we're living in a moment where we're we're spending an inordinate amount of time on this issue of what the behavior of a president and a former president is i mean i've never we've never had this where they're literally microscopically looking at everything that a president will do. I mean, how, how will our government function if we don't figure out a way out of this right now? We'll never have a functioning democracy again. And that's what people know. Because if, 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 if every president has to face impeachment every time that there's a switch in the, in the, every time there's a midterm election, how are we going to function? I mean, you're almost actually begging for a deep state then. Because the only way you can have a functioning country is if this show goes on and there's actually something going on behind the scenes that's moving stuff. You're actually asking for it because you can't have a functioning democracy otherwise. So everyone's going to have to be in on it. I understand, but you're, you're basically saying that's what we're turning it over to. That's what you're saying. You're saying if we're going to get sucked into this, and if this is what we're going to get distracted by, then we'll... Yeah, but who would have thought that this was what ended up happening? And, 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 and couple that with bricks. But, but, how, but who, would have thought, who would have thought that this is the way it was going to end? Not with, not, with, not with substantial discussions over how we exist but by the the uh the constant hammering of on presidential minutia and behavior which didn't start five years ago it started it started during bill clinton's time and i'm not saying he didn't deserve the scrutiny i'm just saying the the, mo the moment yeah but they didn't have they didn't have an open impeachment trial where they discussed the sexual proclivities of the president at the time. I, I'm just saying, we opened it up and, and we're dealing with the consequences now. So until we figure out a way to get that genie back in the bottle, 
you can't expect anybody to believe that a government can function right now. So we, uh, we, um, we know this. We're not stupid. Most of us are not stupid. Some of us don't care, but, um, but that's what happened. And guess what? Um, people who serve the government need to know that they uh, are um, accountable. And, um, but who are they accountable to? And based off sections from Torah, then what is or what would be the most ideal form of government? Because the judges mean <clears throat> that you would be ruled by many, like a Congress, but then it's saying that we would choose a king. So then he's saying an elected monarchy. <laughs> well, so what's it's interesting because you could you could make the you could make the argument that John would say is the more Maimonidean argument, which is how could they have anything but a king when everyone else had a king, right? And so, just like they needed sacrifices, they needed a king because who else is going to be a king, right? The difference is is the king had to be chosen by God. He had to be one of your own people. But it's still, it was still chosen by the people as well, though. Yeah, Maimonides said. They, 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 the people weren't mature enough. That's a bad word. Okay, but but that's what but that's what it's okay. But that's what it says, yourself. folks. Folks, here's what it says. It says this here, and it said it in the book of Samuel too. When the people come to Samuel and say, "Make us king," I will. When the people have taken possession of it, and you decide, I will set a king above, above over me, on, over us, as do all the nations about me. So why are you doing it? Because everyone else is doing it. The Torah actually tells us that. What I'm saying, but it still assumes the consent of the government, though. Okay. Because so, it's not like the people of England. It's even to, worse than that. Well, it's not like went Jesse, it's, it's even worse than that because it says that the people are going to do it because everyone else is doing it. And so, what, what there is an understanding of, you could make, well, there's a lot of different ways you could understand that. But you asked a good question, which is what is the ideal form of government that the Bible actually sees? First of all, Interestingly, and again, I probably am biased towards this, but one of the things that the Bible just gave us is the separation of powers. So it actually just gave us the fact that there can't be one person making the decisions. First of all, there's there's a legal code which makes which is which is the top. I but, was thinking about that, but then there's the issue of obviously the less people you have, the more corrupt it becomes. But then you have the issue of a Pareto distribution where the bigger a government gets, the more incompetent it becomes. Because most congressmen are complete buffoons and don't know anything. And there's like five that actually can do anything. So, so it's like, so you can't have it big because then you get a bunch of mongrels. And so, you get a bunch so, of idiots. So if you have it too small, then you just fall into the issue that we were just talking about where it becomes corrupt. So what we what the Bible kind of understands, I would say, again, I'm a little biased because I'm an American and I believe in a system of, of, of checks and balances and a, in a distribution of powers uh, that the system, that the Bible actually hopes that that'll be the case with the other important caveat that they have a system of rules that they follow. So the, 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 not only is there the balance of power, but that there's also uh, an understanding that it's not just made up of the decisions that these people in that time make, but that they're that they have to deal with the rules that are um, whatever you want to say, whether they're based on God, whether they're based on wisdom, whether they're based on the ages. Saying that, yeah, sure, you have the one king who may or may not be corrupt because you know David's line fell apart in like two generations, but then at the same time. That, that the Torah is supposed to be there to teach him that, and that was what the founders had said, is, look, the Constitution can't work if these people aren't Christian. If the Americans aren't religious, it's not going to work. Well, 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 hold it a second. We would, we would say, of course, that, that there's, a certain, there's a certain standard of behavior that, that is understood is going to be taken on by, by the people of society. It also, of course, the Constitution, to some extent, was created by people who did not give everybody the right to vote. So understand that, and I'm not saying that. Intelligent people. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm telling you that. Well, take into consideration who actually, and I don't mean that from an ethnic standpoint. I'm talking about from the standpoint of who was allowed to vote in 
1780s or 18 early up to the early 1800s. So we uh, we have that issue, and and uh, you know the Torah the Torah doesn't uh, the Torah never says it's only about men because the laws are clearly for men and for women, and men and women can be punished equally. And to some extent, they have to hear the law equally. We, we, we've read that before. We'll read it again here in Deuteronomy that the men and the women had to understand and hear the law. But there's an understanding that they're actually going to uh, willingly follow that law and that they're, that they're going to agree to be under that law. All those things, I think, again, it's hard for me to say. Am I, I'm, I'm totally biased. I'm totally biased by living in in the 20th and 21st century in America. So I'm totally biased here. So it's difficult for me to, 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 really, to really answer that question because over the scheme of, of lots of history, including American history, including world history, including Jewish history, like we don't, we don't, we, we can only speak from our own experience. And, and I will tell you that the way I read it, the Torah is actually giving us a vision of like kind of how we could ideally govern in the United States. But I, I'm saying that from my, from my point of view, I'm, I'm willing to concede that. So I, I can only tell you that's my take of it. And that's my take on, on the way this is uh, played out. I, I, interestingly, interestingly, I would say this, I see, and maybe I'm biased, but I see this as a, the description of what we have in the United States is more reflective of, the Torah, then let's say Britain, a country that doesn't have a constitution, that doesn't have, that has essentially a parliamentary democracy. I don't see that being what the Torah is really talking about. I, I, I don't, again, I could be biased, but I don't really, I don't really see it. I don't see, I don't see the, I don't see the foundations of parliamentary democracy there. I don't. Because essentially parliamentary democracy could essentially rewrite their rules at any given time. I mean, it's a little bit more complicated. England's maybe not the best example because they don't have a constitution, but Israel doesn't have a constitution. There's a lot of parliamentary democracies that don't have constitutions. So, gosh, I think having a, uh, I think having a document that you're, that you're subservient to, I think that's pretty important. But, you know, I don't know. I was raised to admire and 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 have a sense of awe to the constitution but maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm maybe i'm wrong no, I, I, that's fair i think and then you have to remember what that constitution is about because we were talking about that with the constellations an hour ago right like sure you can appreciate the constellations and what the what the the star signs mean and everything but as long as you don't worship them because too many times i find American patriots were like, oh, we just trusted in the Constitution. I'm like, it's a piece of paper. Why are you trusting the paper? What is behind that? What is holding up that paper? It says, you know, right there, it's to learn to learn to revere the God where every word of the teaching is his. You don't just worship the scroll that's on his throne. You have to worship where those words came from. There, there's no question. And and that is definitely part of, of this, which is right here. So that he may learn to revere God Adonai. So there's no question that the teachings are connected to that. There's no question that in Judaism there's an authority to it that is not man-made. Right. But again, you know, we we have to we have to uh, you know keep that in mind that 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 is part of obviously what the Jewish take of this is. So I think that's actually a good place for us to 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 wrap up even though again chapter 18 is not necessarily a good place to break as we say every time deuteronomy doesn't really end uh we're gonna be reading about i thought maybe we'd get to this line but i'll show it to you right now you know when you worship other gods and you're following the practices of those nations let there be none found who consigns a son or daughter to the fire it says right there right. talking about human sacrifice so these things are all woven together, and uh, soothsayer, augur, diviner, sorcerer, um, this kosim kasamim, 
is probably translated uh, verse 10. To get back to what we talked about, as you reminded us an hour ago, Mary, what does verse 10 say? Verse 10 says, consigns a daughter, son or daughter to the fire. And then what's the next line? Observer of times. What does your say, Glory? Uh, after verse 10, after consigns their son or daughter to fall. Divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, witchcraft or in the next word, or cast spells. All right. So, yeah, it pretty much covers all that stuff. Talking to spirits, talking to... But this word right here, I was going for what the actually the King James came the closest to. Uh, kosem kasamim. Uh, they said they translated as an auger, uh, looking at omens, but oftentimes that phrase is specifically used for astrologers. Mm. So, um, that is, uh, they translate it as auger because maybe the person's looking at other signs or omens, but that is oftentimes what the word was used for. Uh, the other words, um, uh, Menachash, they translated as a soothsayer, or no, Onen, uh, Onen is one, uh, as a soothsayer, and diviner as a Nachash. That's oftentimes maybe somebody who used snakes. Mm. It's maybe the der derivation. And the uh, Chasef, uh, Chasef is the uh, sorcerer. And then it continues on in the cast spells, a Chover Chaver, which is a, one who spells spells, which is why they translate it as cast spells. And then the last one is Shael Ov or Viadoni. Those are oftentimes used together. Those are people who talk to ghosts. Um, and they translate it. There's two words, right? There's an Ov and Yadoni. This is somebody who um, maybe talks to spirits that are not necessarily people who died. Uh, so spirits, you know, genies, things like that. And then the last one is talking to the dead. Uh, that would seem to be specifically creating, you know, doing seances and things like that. Anyways, we'll talk about that next week uh, when we're into the new year. Wow. Think about that. The next year, we're going to be reading chapter 18. We're going to start with Chai. We're going to start with life. Chapter 18 of Deuteronomy. Uh, as you can see, we're in the last uh, half of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy goes on. Um, we'll be reading for the, the next few weeks. Uh, Deuteronomy. And there will be many, many laws, including next week. We're going to be able to read. I'll show you one of the laws we're going to we're going to get into next week. Um, we're going to read about. Uh, we're going to get into this right here. Um, going into battle. Going into battle. And uh, we're going to be reading about that as well. So that's a very important part of laws that we're going to read about. Going to battle, John. And we're going to read the famous law where the general has to say to the people, are you ready to go into battle? Because if you're not, go home. Go home. Is there anybody? Is there anyone who is afraid or disheartened, let him go back home, lest the courage of his comrades. All right, everybody, have a happy new year. It's good to have you all here for the last uh, time of of uh, we get of uh, this year. We get to wish you all a happy new year. And happy new year. Happy new year. Everybody. Shana Tova. Don't forget, if you're watching us remotely right now, participating remotely right now, Join us for high holidays. Join us online for, for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. All that is all going to be ready to come up too. So I know for those who are outside of California, east of us, it might be a little late, but we'd love to have you. Okay? Take care, everybody. And that includes you guys, Shulmans, obviously. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Shana Tova. Thanks, Rabbi. Take Shana Tova. Take care. Shana Tova. We'll see you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. So.